Hey, how's it going? My name is Cedar George Parker. I'm from the Tlaloc Nation and Tlaloc Tribes, and today we're on episode three of Whatever's Wild. Today we'll be doing a deep dive into the world of fracking and LNG liquefied natural gas. And let me tell you something, it's definitely not good, but we're lucky because we're here with my coworker, friend, and here our climate campaigner with the Wilderness Committee, the one, the only, Peter McCartney. And so, yeah, he's been working at Wilderness Committee for eight years, and he's the one going to be telling us about LNG fracking, why it's not good, and yeah, we'll take it away. And we want to introduce yourself if I missed anything. Yeah, I'm, my name is Peter McCarty. I'm the climate campaigner here and uh, working lots on fracking and LNG and excited to tell you all about it. Nice. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I'm excited that you're here. So let's dive right into it first, right? Let's, 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 go, let's go see why it's not good. You know, what, what is LNG? Where does it come from and why is it harmful? Yeah, so the gas that they are liquefying and fracking for is called methane gas. Methane gas. And fracking is how they get it out of the ground. So they will take 5 billion liters a year worth of water out of local lakes and rivers in northeastern BC where all of the fracking happens. They mix it with a toxic chemical cocktail and silica sand and then they pump it underground in a well at really high pressure. What that does is it breaks open the shale rock two kilometers below the earth and the water rushes in and the gas pumps out. And so the fracking companies will then process it. They will ship it across British Columbia in a pipeline and then they send it to a liquefied natural gas plant on the coast where they will freeze it down to negative 162 degrees Celsius. So really cold. That turns it into a liquid so they can put it on the tanker and send it across the ocean to Asia where they plan to sell this stuff. So that's where the fracked gas comes from. Why it's so bad for the climate is because the methane that they are fracking for is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. It causes 86 times more global warming than carbon dioxide over its lifetime in the atmosphere. Whoa. So gas actually heats the climate faster than coal because of the methane that uh, enters the atmosphere. And that's why it's so bad for the climate and why we're working so hard to stop it. Yeah, and I remember you said a statistic, something um, before I was talking with you. You said something about one-fourth, like 25%. You said of the, they said that, uh, what was that statistic you're yeah, talking about? So if I could just get clarification. Sure. Of the global warming that we've seen so far, a quarter of it is caused by methane. So it's a huge problem. It's also one of the easiest things to solve. Damn, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's wild, man. Sorry, I just remember you talking about that um, before earlier today where we just came back from an event today, and a, a rally. And so I remember you saying that that's, that's kind of the statistic that got me like, whoa, you know, kind of made me freeze up. And so, yeah, I heard you say words across British Columbia. So, like, um, what's the current status of LNG projects in, in BC and where are they coming? You know what I mean? All throughout BC. Yeah, so uh, most folks will have heard of the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline. Obviously, the Wet'suwet'en uh, hereditary chiefs have fought really hard to stop it. Unfortunately, that pipeline is nearing completion, and the liquefied natural gas uh, facility that it would feed, LNG Canada and Kitimat, is due to be complete next year. So that one facility is going to be the most polluting project in the province. At full build-out, if they build the second half of it, they will, it will cause more pollution than all of the passenger vehicles in British Columbia. So it's a staggering amount of climate pollution. Uh, but that's not the only one. There are more facilities. Uh, wood fiber LNG in Squamish is, has all its permits, wants to start construction. They recently got their flotel, so they were going to house their workers in Howe Sound on a ship. That was voted down by the Squamish Regional District. And so no one really knows what comes next for wood fiber LNG. Tilbury LNG in the middle of the Fraser River, right here in the lower mainland between Delta and Richmond, just got its permits from the provincial government for the marine portion of the project. So the part that actually sticks out into the river and loads up the tankers. And then on land, the expansion of the facility itself is still working its way through the review process. Cedar LNG, which was not named after you, um, in Kitimat is, has its permits from the provincial and federal governments. They are still waiting for their companies that back the project 
to make their final investment decision to actually decide to go ahead with the project. And then the last one, Salisum's LNG, in Nishka territory right near the mouth of the Nass River, that project is almost as big as LNG Canada Phase 1. It's a, another major facility, and that is just it's sort of starting the review process, but they are chugging along as fast as they can, and so we're really trying to raise the alarm about uh, Salisum's LNG and the Prince Rupert gas transmission line that would feed it. Whoa. Yeah, man, that's a, that's a lot of projects going on, especially like in an era where Canada and even BC are coming up with their new commitments, right? When it comes to climate, when it comes to environment, they're making all of these promises, but here they are pushing these projects through. And I guess the next question is, um, how will this affect provincial, federal, and global climate commitments? Yeah, so the provincial government has a climate plan called Clean BC. And if all five of these liquefied natural gas projects go forward, it's game over for that plan. Uh, they have told the oil and gas industry to limit their emissions to around 9 megatons a um, year by 2030. And if all of those projects move forward and they run on gas, because it takes gas to power the liquefaction, they would exceed that target by threefold. So over 30 megatons a year, and that makes it effectively impossible for BC to meet its climate commitments. The BC government, on the other hand, they say, oh, we're going to run these, uh, all these liquefied natural gas projects on renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have, quote unquote, net zero LNG, which is not a real thing. And the only problem with that is these facilities require a huge amount of energy to freeze that gas down to so cold they can liquefy it. And it would take 8.4 site C dams worth of clean electricity to power these facilities. And there are so many better uses for renewable energy than exporting fossil fuels. We are trying to move to electric vehicles, to heat pumps in people's homes. Uh, these things run on electricity. And so even if they did manage to electrify the industry, they're only diverting power from the things that actually work uh, to electrify the rest of the province. Hmm. Yeah, you know, when I, when I hear that, it makes me think like, you know, so we're we talking about the problems, why it's bad, what they're doing right now in BC, how many projects they're pushing through. And it just seems like, like it's just kind of crazy, right? That they make these promises and kind of like still pushing it, pushing these projects, right? That are harmful for the environment and people, health and safety. I mean, it's like, like you said, it's a whole mixology <laughs> right here of problems. And it's like, and so what I like about the work that you're doing is that, you know, we're looking at solutions and we're doing something about it. And so I guess my next question is, is like, as we talk about contemporary, it's like, what is the Wilderness Committee doing to end fracking and stop LNG right now? Yeah, the Wilderness Committee has been working on fracking for a long time. And what we have seen in other places is that what stops the gas industry is a really popular movement of everyday people demanding better of their governments, demanding that they end fracking. So they've done this in New York, in California, in Washington, in Quebec, New Brunswick. Uh, they have managed to end fracking. And what we are doing is partnering with our friends at Stand and Dogwood uh, with the Frack Free BC group. Uh, we are bringing in our allies like My Sea to Sky and David Suzuki Foundation and really working to build that movement across the province of people who are taking action in their daily lives to ask the provincial government to phase out this industry and develop a plan for the workers and communities that rely on it so that uh, everybody's taken care of. Uh, so Frack Free BC, we've had a bunch of actions. We just had one this morning. We painted a mural outside of the big gas conference at Canada Place and we ask folks to organize in their own communities and put pressure on the provincial government to do the right thing. So I heard you you said a key word phase out and so so as we start to phase out of fracking and LNG you know the, the next question is what can we do instead you know what, what are the solutions you know how are we going to phase it out? Yes the good news at least in BC our electricity grid is mostly renewable energy. It comes from hydro, which 
despite all its environmental impacts, doesn't create climate pollution. And so we can run everything that we currently use for fracked gas. The vast majority of that is for home heating and water heating. And we can do that with heat pumps. They work just like a refrigerator, except instead of extracting heat from the inside and pushing it out the back, they work in the opposite direction. Actually, they work both ways. And they can take heat from the outside environment or from underground and bring it into your house, keep you hot in the winter and cool in the summer. Hmm. Um, so heat pumps really are the, the solution. We don't need fracked gas. Yeah, so we talked about solutions, talked about how can we solve it. You know, we went into... What is it? What's happening right now? And so as we start to get to the end of our minutes of this, is there anything else you want to say just to put out there? Yeah, there's one thing I'm really excited about, which is our Forward for a Frack-Free Future gathering at the beginning of June, June 7th to 9th. And we are bringing folks from all over the province for speaker panels, for workshops, help folks really understand the issue, uh, hear from some of the people that are impacted, and skill up so that they can go back to their communities, put pressure on their local MLAs, get this in front of their candidates in the provincial election, which is coming up on October, and we can really make fracking and LNG the biggest climate problem for the government because it's the biggest climate problem for British Columbians. Yeah, that sounds like a great place to wrap it up. Um, yeah, thank you for sitting here with us, you know, and and yeah, you know, we like like when you say that, you know, we could come together and when we come together is when we can really make a change, right? And and so that's all the work, you know, all these different organizations, all these different people, you know, when we come together, we can be one solid voice, right? And really make sure we, we go by those commitments that we start to phase out LNG and fracking and, you know, ultimately keep our beautiful British Columbia beautiful. And so, yeah, we're going to wrap it up right there. Thank you to our viewers. Um, thank you for tuning in to the third episode of Whatever is Wild with Peter McCartney and me, Cedar George Parker. Make sure to follow us on our social medias. Make sure to uh, go to Frack Free BC, their website. Make sure to c continue the fight by coming over to our website, wildernesscommunity.org. And yeah, thank you. Have a good day.